Hello, welcome back to the Apocrypha Apocalypse. I'm Gary Machuda, and we are continuing our series looking at early Christian lists. And of course, this is the mainstay for Protestant apologetics against the Deuterocanon, what they call the Apocrypha. They appeal to these lists, and they say, see here are the early church fathers that are giving us the definitive list of sacred scripture, of inspired scripture, of canonical scripture, and they omit the Deuterocanon. So therefore, the Deuterocanon is rejected by these fathers. And if you've been following this series, what you notice is that this is really an oversimplification of what's going on. In fact, if you look at a typical apologetic that appeals to list, often all you'll see is the names of these fathers. You rarely get the list re reproduced, and you almost never hear about how that early church father used these books and how that fits with the list. And so that's what we've been doing in this series. We've been going through father by father in a near chronological order, beginning with the earliest Christian list of Melito of Sardis. We looked at origin of Alexandria's list. We looked at Athanasius of Alexandria. And in the last episode, we looked at Cyril of Jerusalem. And what we found is that these lists are made for different purposes. They're not giving the objective canonical list or the full extent of all inspired scripture. Rather, they have certain purposes. For example, they may be trying to assess which books are accepted by the Jews so that we can use the same books for evangelization. Others look at scripture and they're picking up books because of some sort of mystical significance. And uh, that's what we've seen in all these lists. And today we're going to take a close look at Hilary of Poitier, who is invariably on those lists of names commonly given as the early church fathers who accepted the Protestant canon. And also in the series, we've noticed the strange area of incoherence for the Protestant position, namely that the lists are often set as a lens through which all the other evidence must conform. And it's kind of like a trump card that overrules all the other evidence in their own works, even in the same work. And we've shown that this incoherence is unnecessary, that really we should look at all the evidence together and indeed use their usage of books to inform how we understand the list. What happens then is this tension that is artificially brought about by misconstruing what exactly is going on the list disappears. Same thing's true here with Hilary of Poitier. So without further ado, let's jump into the Apocrypha Apocalypse. All right, so what I want to do is just so you don't feel like I'm misrepresenting the other people's opinions and how this information is typically presented on the web, I'm going to give some websites. I'm just singling them out because I think they're quite typical and they're reflected in many other websites of their kind. First, uh, an article that's written called Canon, Why the Roman Catholic Arguments for the Canon are Spurious published by christiantruth.com. It's written by William Webster. And here's what he has to say. Quote, there are major fathers in the church prior to the North African councils who rejected the judgment of these councils, such as Origen, Melito of Sardis, Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem, Gregory of Nazianzus, Hilary of Poitiers, Epiphanius, Basil the Great, Jerome, Rufinus, and a host of others. They hold to the view, generally speaking, that the Old Testament books were 22 in number, or sometimes listed as 24, depending on how the books were grouped together. This corresponds to the Jewish canon, which did not accept the books of the Apocrypha as being canonical. And as we'll see with Hilary Poitier, that's simply not true. But nevertheless, notice it's just simply naming. Right? They don't go into detail. They don't really give list. That's fairly typical. Here's another website. This is from Roman Catholic and Orthodox Faith Examined and the Apocrypha. The author is not named. It comes from uh, Bible.ca, 
Catholic dash apocrypha htm. It's a very quick citation from Hillary. It says on point 20, Hillary, Bishop of Poitiers, 350 AD, rejected the apocrypha, prologue to the Psalms, section 15. So you just have Hillary's name, a quick statement that he rejected the so-called Apocrypha and where you could find the list. Again, very typical, minimal information, usually part of a whole list of other church fathers that receive about as much information. Sometimes you get a little bit more. For example, I found on an article three, it's called Apocrypha article three, church fathers and the councils reject it by Dr. C. Matthew McMahon, the Apocrypha and Apologetics. This is from www.appearedtonmind.com. And here's their quick entry. They say, Hillary, Bishop of Poitiers, says, quote, the law of the Old Testament is considered as divided into 22 books, so as to correspond to the number of letters, unquote. And that's about it. And actually, when we look at it again, you're going to see there's a lot more going on than even this short quote gives. Did Hillary really reject the Deuterocanon as apocrypha? What was this list meant to represent if he didn't? And what does his use of the Deuterocanon tell us about his list? Well, why don't we quickly look at the list itself? Again, this is from the commentary on the Psalms, section 15. It reads as follows, quote, and this is the cause that the law of the Old Testament is divided into 22 books, that they may agree with the number of letters. These books are arranged according to the traditions of the ancients, so that five are of Moses, the sixth is from Jesus' nave, the seventh is Judges and Ruth, first and second of Kings formed the eighth, third and fourth of Kings formed the ninth, the two books of Parapolipnum formed the 10th. The Discourses of the Days of Ezra formed the 11th. The Book of Psalms, the 12th. Solomon's Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Canticle of the Canticles form the 13th, 14th, and 15th. The 12th Prophets formed the 16th. While Isaiah, then Jeremiah, the Lamentations, and the Epistle, Daniel, Ezekiel, Job, and Esther complete the number 22 books. To some, it seems good to add Tobias and Judith, and thus constitute 24 books according to the Greek alphabet. And again, that's from his prologue on the commentary of Psalms, section 15. Now, it's recognized by pretty much everybody that Hillary's list is dependent on origin of Alexandria's list in his preface to the Psalms which is preserved in a fragment by Eusebius Church History 625, in case you want to look at it. We've already gone over Origen's list from that fragment in Eusebius, and if you want to consult that, you can. As we pointed out, Origen's purpose seems to be that he wishes to supply Hebrew names of books that correspond to the number 22, which is the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. There's a curious thing because Origen omits the 12 minor prophets and he ends up one short of 22. So he includes Maccabees and gives the Hebrew title for the book of Maccabees, even though he states that it's not included in the number. Well, we've gone over that and there's several options as to what's going on. My personal opinion is that his main endeavor, his main purpose is to find 22 Hebrew books so that they correspond to letters. He comes up one short, he can't figure out where he's missing. And so therefore he adds Maccabees in order to fulfill the number, which show that really his main desire is to make that correspondence of letters, but that's beside the point. The main point is that Origen was from the school of Alexandria, which relied on the allegorical understanding of scripture and more mystical understanding of scripture. And so it really wouldn't be out of place for him to be looking at some sort of mystical uh, correspondence of letters and numbers and books and so on. Hillary, by following origin, is pretty much cut from the same cloth. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind.
it seems that Hillary is much more concerned about finding a correspondence of letters of the alphabet and languages to books than actually the books themselves. In other words, he's not trying to give an objective canon. Now, why do I say that? Well, we get this from Hillary himself. For example, in the preceding paragraph, 14, Hillary was investigating the mystic reasons behind the use of the number eight in scripture. So he's already looking at mystical correspondence of numbers in the scriptures themselves. And again, like I said, origin seems to have that kind of mystical bent in the fragment that we found from Eusebius. And unfortunately, since we only have a fragment, it's impossible to tell exactly what Origen was up to. But nevertheless, Hillary begins with this mystical investigation into the use of eight. And then in 15, he turns his attention away from eight to consider the mystical correspondence between the number of letters in alphabets and the books of the Old Testament. Now, like Origen, it's this number that drives the contents of his list, not the objective inspired scriptures computing the number. It's really the number computes the list. How do I know this? Well, he says this himself. In the very first line of introduction for his list, he says, and this is the cause that the law of the Old Testament is divided into 22 books that they might agree with the number of letters. So he's saying, look at the Old Testament. Some of the ancients divided books in this sort of way. Why? Because that would make it correspond to letters. So the number of letters in the alphabet caused the ancients to divide the Old Testament into 22 books. But that's only the Hebrew alphabet. What about the Greek alphabet, which has 24 letters? Well, at the very end of the list, and this is sometimes left off when uh, non-Catholics quote Hillary, he says, to some, it seems good to add Tobias and Judith and thus constitute 24 books according to the Greek alphabet. Now, this should raise red flags for the close reader because Hillary, if you're giving us the canon, the extent of all inspired scripture, then what is that canon? Is it the 22 or is it the 24 that includes Tobit and Judith? Clearly, it's either 22 or the larger collection of 24. So it's clear that he doesn't mean to give us the objective extent collection of all inspired works, but rather he's showing us how the Old Testament can be divided up according to numbers and letters. And it's interesting that he includes Tobit and Judith in this list, because as we saw with Origen, which Hillary's depended on, uh, Hillary is reproducing the books that were accepted by the rabbis of his day. I think it would also make a very interesting video to kind of sketch out what we know about which books were retained within rabbinical Judaism, uh, which appears to include deuterocanonical books. And this is one of those instances. So maybe in the future video, we'll look at that. And of course, that makes us ask the question, if these books were never considered by any Jew to be sacred and inspired, it's pretty strange that they would continue to copy these books, even though they don't have any authoritative weight. Just saying. All right. So which one of the two, the 22 or 24, did Hillary accept? Well, we have to go to usage. How did he use these books? We see that he definitely would at least hold to the 24 computation, which includes the two deuterocanonical books of Judith and Tobit. For example, in his tractate on Psalm 125, paragraph 6, he introduces a quote from Judith as coming out of the law. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, out of the law, what does that mean? It's not part of the books of Moses. Well, if you look at that first line in his computation, his list, he actually introduces the list as, quote, and this is the cause that the law of the Old Testament is divided into 22 books. So he sees the law as part of the Old Testament, the 22 books, right? So if you believe that the proto-canon that he mentions there 
is scripture in its fullest sense, then this quote from Judith shows that he believed Judith was part of that number. It was equal to the 22. And also in his tractate on Psalm 129.7, we see him also referring to Tobit as well. This one is just simply a reference. There's no formal introduction or anything like that. But nevertheless, since there's no qualification or distinction, it appears that he likewise would accept Tobit. So at least we can say Hillary held to the 24 book computation, which doesn't square with the Protestant canon. That's if you figure in how he uses these books. But let's go back to the main point. I don't believe Hillary is giving us the objective canon. That is the extent of all inspired writings. And I think this is borne out by his usage. So why don't we look at some of the books that were omitted from his 22 and 24 book computation and see how he uses it in his works. Now, one such book is the book of Sirach. And it's interesting later in the very same prologue which he gives the list. Hillary quotes Sirach 133 with the formal introduction, according to that which is spoken. So we can see here, he gives a formal introduction to Sirach. Very interesting since it's only a few paragraphs after he gives that mystical list in 15. Moreover, he also quotes Sirach twice as coming from Solomon, apparently from the books of Solomon. And here are the three instances that I found where he introduces it as coming from Solomon. So you see, he believes that Sirach is authoritative. He uses a formal introduction for it, an introduction that would be used for the protocanon, for sacred scripture. Another book that's omitted is the Book of Wisdom. Yet we find twice in the very same work, so we're not even going outside of his commentary on Psalms, Quoting wisdom as coming explicitly from the prophet. We see here one example, and here is the second example. And he also quotes it as coming from Solomon, just like we saw with Sirach. Very interesting. So obviously he didn't reject these books as apocrypha because they come from the prophet, they come from Solomon, it can be introduced with a formal introduction. They're used in a way indistinguishable from inspired scripture. How about Baruch? Now, what's interesting in the list, Hillary seems to have omitted the book of Baruch. He says, quote, then Jeremiah, the Lamentations, and the Epistle. So you have the book of Jeremiah, the book of Lamentations, and the Epistle, which is the Epistle of Jeremiah. But it's interesting that he didn't explicitly include Baruch with Jeremiah Lamentations in the epistle, as it traditionally is with the other fathers. Does that mean that he rejected Baruch? No, not at all. In fact, we see him quoting Baruch in a very substantial way, twice on his treatise on the Trinity, his most famous work. In Book 4, Section 43, he says, besides Moses and Isaiah, Listen in the third place to Jeremiah, who taught the same doctrine when he declares, this is our God, and there shall be no other accounted in comparison with him. This comes from Baruch chapter 3, a very famous prophecy about Christ. And notice he counts it as part of Jeremiah. Likewise, later in book 5, in section 39, he says, quote, Jeremiah was endowed with a similar prophetical power and thus inform us that the nature of the only begotten God was inseparable from the nature of God the Father. When he declared, this is our God, there shall no other be accounted of in comparison of him. Again, the same part of Baruch. And here notice, in both, it's used to confirm doctrine. And in this last part, he says that Jeremiah, with a prophetical power, says something in Baruch. And this is very important because uh, just because Baruch is omitted in 
Hillary's list doesn't mean it wasn't part of that collection of Jeremiah. And we'll do a video in the future to show how the early church fathers do this, that they more or less see it as a package of Jeremiah, Lamentations, Baruch, and Epistle. Uh, we won't get into that here, but it's enough to show that this book is omitted in his list, yet very clearly he understands it as prophetic. Very clearly he sees it as part of Jeremiah, which he does explicitly list. What about Maccabees? He doesn't mention Maccabees in his list. Did he reject Maccabees? Doesn't seem so. For example, in one place, he, he gives a couple of examples from the book of Daniel. And then he follows it by an example of the Maccabean martyrs, which we saw in Second Ma Maccabees 6 and 7. Notice there's no qualification or distinction that Hillary makes between these two examples. As far as he's concerned, they're both the same authority, same source. Fine. So that opens the door, the possibility they accept the Maccabees. However, elsewhere, he quotes Maccabees as coming from the prophet. And so here we have an explicit declaration of Maccabees' inspiration when he says, concerning the, the doctrine of creation from nothing, creation ex nihilo, he says, for all according to the prophet were made out of nothing. What's he referring to? He's referring to 2 Maccabees 7.28. The Maccabean mother exhorts her child to hold to faith till the end. Why? Because God created everything ex nihilo, the same Latin words used by Hillary. So you see here uh, where all the books that were not listed amongst the 22 books are affirmed by Hillary. It's quoted explicitly as coming from the prophet, coming from the scripture, being used to confirm doctrine, all of them being used as scripture in its fullest sense. And that's one of the reasons why I love doing this Apocrypha Apocalypse channel, because for non-Catholics, they see these books as Apocrypha. And if all they're relying on is just your run-of-the-mill apologetics that you find on the web and so on, you would never know first that Hillary was doing this mystical computation of numbers, of uh, letters and alphabets and books. You would never have known that Hillary actually proposes not just 22, but a 24 book canon that includes two canonical books. And unless you dive into the Latin and unearth what he wrote in his other letters, even within the commentary itself, you would never know that Hillary himself did not hold to this computation because he wasn't giving the objective canon. He wasn't giving the canon of scripture. He was just speculating about how we could divide books into letters of the alphabets. And apparently, since he's dependent on origin, this also lends even more credence to what we've said about origin, that origin's just reproducing the books that the rabbis of his time used. And specifically, I think origin was focusing, again, on this mystical correspondence of numbers, letters, alphabets, things like that. So, if you went to a uh, typical apologetic site, like we pointed out earlier, all you would see is Hillary confirms the Protestant canon, or they'll give some clip, or they'll say he rejected it as Apocrypha, or he'll have that line where he says it consists of 22 books, and that's it. And you would never have known all of this information. So it's really my pleasure and William Albrecht's pleasure to reveal all this information for those who don't even know it exists. And that's why we call this channel the Apocrypha Apocalypse, because we're showing non-Catholics who think these books are Apocrypha. We're revealing all the information and we're leaving up to you to decide. As far as I'm concerned, there's no way Hillary should belong to any list of early church evidence for the Protestant canon. And that's just a long line that continues from Melito to Origen, to, uh, Athanasius to Cyril of Jerusalem. We've just seen here Hillary as well. And, uh, and this is the strongest early church case for 
Christians accepting the restricted canon. It's actually, as we look at all the evidence, we're actually finding incredible evidence in favor of the Deuterocanon in these cases. I don't know what to say. So we're going to continue this series on a list. We're going to look at Ampeliochius's list next. And at least we'll get a little closer to some sort of substantial proof. And there's lots of information too that we can bring to bear on that issue. So thank you for watching. By the way, if you enjoy this program, please, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, like, tell your friends about it because uh, we want to get this information out there. So thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.